Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to walk through some 12 lead practice. By far the most successful video this channel has had it has been uh, rhythm practice. People like rhythm practice, they like mega code simulators, and I've had some requests for 12 lead practice, which I have posted in the past, but I think people need a little bit more based on what they're telling me. So what we're going to do is some 12 lead practice with walkthroughs. So we're going to talk about what it is and we're going to talk about why. This will be the first of what I'm hoping will be at least a five part series. Let's just see how it goes. So everything is on the table. This will not just be stimmies. It will not just be normal stuff. It, this everything that can go wrong will be on the table. All right. What we'll do is we'll start each EKG on the screen. I'll tell you, you can pause the video, take as much time as you want to interpret it. And then we'll go through an explanation. This will keep the video a little bit shorter. All right. Now, this is by far my favorite picture as of anything that pertains to cardiology because hands down, this is the best EKG tool that has ever existed. All right. This shows you all of the anatomy or what I've taken to call in geography and the three main coronary arteries, what they represent and what we see. Okay. Now scarbosis criteria will come into play in this series. It is important to remember scarbosis criteria with the Smith modification if you haven't watched the video on that, please go back and watch it. The Smith modification made it much more sensitive and specific. And I have never had a problem picking out a transmural MI in the presence of a pacemaker or a left bundle branch block using Scarbosa's criteria with the Smith modification. So please do go back and look at that. This is another thing that you should remember. This is the evolution of T-wave inversion after coronary reperfusion. But understand that this can be present after any period of extreme ischemia. So after Prince Metal's angina or Wellen syndrome, you can still see things like this. It's important to recognize that this is a sign of the aftermath of ischemia and sometimes injury. All right, let's go into the first one. I know this is a little blurry, but hey, in the real world, not all EKGs look like you would like them to look. All right. Take a second, pause the video if you need to, and then come up with your interpretation. All right, let's move forward. So this is an inferior STEMI. I gave you an easy one to go with, right? Let's talk about why. So you can see in leads two, three, and AVF, we have extreme ST segment elevation in leads one and AVL. There is certainly reciprocal depression, all that you could ask for. Leads V2 and V3, we have a significant amount of ST segment depression here, indicating this patient is right coronary artery dominant and that the posterior wall of the myocardium is involved in this. If you haven't seen the videos explaining this, go back to Understanding 12 Leads Part 1, and you can learn more about this. But it is an important thing to note because this is a large area of infarct and a cause for concern for anybody who's working on this patient. Let's go to the next one here. Pause the video, take a second, and come up with your interpretation. All right, so this is a high lateral, another easy win here as we kind of break into this. All right, let's go back and talk about why. If you follow the cursor in leads one and AVL, there is absolutely ST segment elevation. And you can see in three and AVF, beautiful ST segment depression. It's everything we need to say there's absolutely a blocked coronary artery here. Now, if you don't fully understand the vasculature, what vessels blocked and what to expect, I do encourage you to go back to the Understanding 12 Lead series and watch it. A lot of good information in there, but this is a high lateral. Usually a left circumflex blockage is involved when you see this. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, so another inferior STEMI, usually a blockage of the right coronary artery when we see this. So leads two, three, and AVF. An incredible amount of ST segment elevation. One in AVL has the reciprocal depression that we really want to see to ensure that we're not wrong here. And then we can also see in lead V2 and a little in V1 ST segment depression indicating that this, there's also some posterior involvement in this MI as well. So not a patient we would expect to be excruciatingly stable. The RCA does perfuse the entirety of the conduction system. So when we see this inferior lead involvement here, we need to anticipate heart blocks. We need to anticipate bradycardia and have all of the measures ready to mitigate these things. Pads already on the patient, atropine already out, presser agents, should you choose to use them, V4R, you know, being very careful with nitrate therapy, 
large bore IV access and the ability to increase preload if we need to. All of those things need to be ready to go. Let's go to the next one. Pause the video. All right, so let's move forward. This is an anoreceptal MI. So remember, septal, septal anterior for V1, V2, V3. We can see considerable ST segment elevation in all three of these. One noteworthy part of this EKG is look at the T wave inversion in lead three in AVF. This indicates ischemia in the inferior wall. This is absolutely not out of the question because remember all three coronary arteries do, all three major coronary arteries do terminate in the inferior wall. So if we have a blockage or if we have ST segment elevation and injury here, uh, it's, it's certainly credible to think that we would have some ischemia in the inferior wall, despite the other two vessels terminating in the wall, they don't cover all the same anatomy. It's not as if they're all built to be interchangeable. All right, let's go to the next one. Take your time, pause the video, come up with your interpretation. All right, so let's move forward. This is AFib. That's one of the reasons I included lead two down at the bottom. Why is it AFib? Because it's an irregularly irregular rhythm. There, there is no R to R interval that is identical here. There is no clearly discernible P wave. This is uh, a little, a little faster than we might like to see in these patients. But is it absolutely something that has to be managed right now? Not necessarily. This may be a patient who's in controlled AFib, but say in pain. Okay. Is there any evidence for massive infarct on this EKG? I don't think so. You guys can respond in the comments if you think there is. Let's go to the next EKG. Pause the video if you need to. All right, so if you've just stared at this thing for five minutes trying to convince yourself there's an MI and you needed to find it, I'm sorry there wasn't. Do remember, most of the EKGs that we print out are going to be somewhat normal, or at least not a STEMI, not a transmural MI sitting in front of us. I think the current numbers right now are, are you know, out of every 100 people who presented the ED with chest pain, two will be having a cardiac event and one will be having an MI. It makes it a 98% chance the patient's not throwing a STEMI if you think about it. And this is all kind of loose statistics, but I didn't make those up on the spot. So many, many causes of chest pain exist. Remember that those phrenic nerves uh, are shared by a lot of different organ systems and pathways. So many things can cause our chest to hurt. Many things can cause that radiating pain. So in a chest pain patient, be prepared to find the MI, but be prepared to find nothing as well. All right. And do understand that just finding a normal sinus rhythm does not mean that there's not something going on that will manifest soon. The hallmark of disease is change over time. And the more aggressive the disease, the faster the changes. So you may very well just see simple sinus tack on a chest pain patient and then 10 minutes later see a STEMI manifest. It's totally possible. So run serial EKGs. A good rule of thumb is if it's time to take vital signs, it's time to mash the 12 lead button. If you're going to take vital signs every five minutes, take a 12 lead every five minutes in the chest pain patient. What does it hurt? It's not invasive. It doesn't shock them. And it gives you something to compare to. So you can see if the axis begins to deviate or if you can see if T waves begin to flatten out or if an ST segment begins to depress or to elevate. Let's go to the next one. Pause the video if you need to. All right, so this is not an easy one to catch, but if you've been following the channel, you were prepared for it. So this is Wellen syndrome type A. Now, if you haven't watched the Wellen syndrome video, by all means, go back and take a look at that. It was in some of the earlier days of the cardiology channel. But essentially, what Wellen syndrome is, to give you kind of a quick glossing over, it's, it's an abnormal stenosis of the left anterior descending artery which means that during periods of stress or high blood pressure or as coronary artery disease begins to manifest early, you've already got a somewhat negative flow, if that makes any sense. You've got a stenotic artery that doesn't flow as, as well as it should. And in periods of arterial clampdown where the body increases vascular resistance, you may begin to see ischemia. Now, the hallmark of Wellens is that the patient has this sudden onset of chest pain. And then usually by the time you get to them or the time they get to you, they're pain free. So you run the EKG and your only real findings are the leftover ischemia in leads in this particular EKG V1, V2, and V3. So you can actually see the leftover ischemia in the biphasic T wave here. Remember the T wave progression that we talked about. 
So one of the things you want to keep in mind is when you see a biphasic T wave like this, you may very well be looking at the aftermath of an arterial clampdown. This patient does need a cath lab. They might not need it right this second, but the current numbers indicate that once a patient has an attack of chest pain and they have true blue wellens, they die on average within seven days of a massive MI. So this patient does need definitive care. They do need an angiogram. So things to keep in mind. All right, let's look at the next one here. So this is another kind of less than average one. This is going to be benign early repolarization. Now I've got some videos on this and I, I am working on a larger project um, to kind of explain more about benign early repol. But remember, this is one of those EKGs where history really comes into play. So is this a young and athletic person, particularly in a male, you know, under 50 years of age? And then look at this ST segment elevation. It just, it doesn't look quite right. For one, there's no reciprocal depression, not even anything close to it. And then we have this notching in the T wave here. And then unlike your traditional STEMIs, quote unquote, where we have the ST segment elevation, it kind of goes down. This one actually swoops up almost like a smiley face. That's sort of the pictography that's associated with it. And you can learn more about BER in the other videos I've posted, but be prepared to see this kind of thing because remember, athletes have chest pain too. Now, this is a good one. Take your time on this. I will say it's not a STEMI, but the heart is working very hard, particularly on the right side. So there's your hint. All right, so this is a classic finding of a large pulmonary embolism or what's known as a saddle embolus. So one of those large, you know, seven, eight centimeter pulmonary emboli that break off and then kind of get lodged in the, in the, the pulmonary circuit and won't let any blood flow into the lungs. Let's explore why. So that uh, you could see here, S1, Q3, T3. So let's talk about what that means. It means a prominent S wave in lead one a prominent Q wave in lead three and an inverted T wave in lead three. It can also mean a slurred Q wave or a slurred S wave. Just remember there's going to be abnormalities of the S, the Q and the T in leads one, two and three, which is why we like to call it S1, Q3, T3. The medical name of it, the textbook name of it is called core pulmonal. If you haven't done any work on this, it's a great thing to do. You can also see this in congestive heart failure patients. Basically, anyone that the right side of the heart is straining very hard, you can see this kind of thing. It's something to keep in mind, especially when people have the right history to have a pulmonary embolism. So post-COVID, we see a lot of coagulopathy. We've seen D-dimers in 30-year-olds that have no business being that high. Um, think of people on hormone therapy. Hormone replacement therapy in males is a huge and growing industry, as well as birth control in females. It's always been there. People who smoke, people who are sedentary. Lots of things that can go on and produce that. So keep in mind history, but be on the lookout for things like this in the chest pain patient. We've only got a couple more in this before we shut it down for the day. Pause the uh, video if you need to. All right, so this is a high lateral. So going kind of back to an easy one, threw a couple of curveballs at you, going to bring it back home here. Leads one in AVL, significant elevation, three in AVF, great amount of depression. You may have gotten a little confused by this stuff over here. Remember, uh, if you were looking for LVH or something of that nature, remember that that kind of stuff isn't important when we're actually looking at a true blue MI. Now, I know that LVH is supposed to be a STEMI imposter, one of the larger projects I'm working on putting in the video format is uh, a containment of my opinion of STEMI imposters. Frankly, they don't exist. There's no such thing as a STEMI imposter. There are incorrect interpretations, but there are no STEMI imposters. There is no STEMI imposter, quote unquote, that a cardiologist can't pick out. And if that's the case, it's because the rules are there. Now, I'm not a cardiologist, but I can tell you that all the rules are clearly present. So forming a clinical picture, taking a good history, and then being able to read an EKG properly is the most important thing. And I'm putting that presentation together for video format. It's one I've given for years live. It's called Nevermind STEMI Imposters. Just be on the lookout for that. All right. Let's go through this one. Pause the video if you need to.
All right, so an inferior STEMI, okay? I don't even, well, I'll, I'll back it up. Leads two, three, and AVF. You can see the elevation. You can see some reciprocal depression in AVL, not as much in one, but remember, we don't need it to be in both of these. We just need it to be in one of them. We just need elevation in these leads. We don't necessarily have to have reciprocal depression. Reciprocal depression is a confirmation. But if you were to have an inferior wall MI brought on by a distal blockage of the left anterior descending, you wouldn't have any reciprocal depression to speak of. But it would still be a STEMI. They would still need a cath lab. They would still need an interventional cardiologist, right? None of that would change. So again, inferior STEMI. Now, if you have questions or concerns, you can put them in the comments. You can also send me an email at shadetreecardiology.com. If you're interested in live lectures, you can contact me at the same place. Get out there and practice.